afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Henrik Saumenskoy, and I am now a lawyer in Copenhagen, and I used to be an advocate general at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg from 2015 until 2021. May I just thank the Polish organizers for this fantastic event and also for inviting me this, to this beautiful city of Krakow. The theme today will be uh, over four judgments where I have served as Advocate General. And let me say from the outset, I was not followed in all of these cases. Uh, the court did not follow part, only partly my opinions. And I will explain to you today where I think we still have some struggles in this area. And may I quote my former French colleague, Yves Bott, who unfortunately died when I was, while I was in office. He said, and I will quote him in French, le rôle de l'avocat général, c'est la mauvaise conscience de la cour. In English translation, the role of an advocate general is to be the bad conscience of the court. And as that as a parting point, I will explain to you why I respectfully still disagree slightly with some of this case law. But first, I will explain to you uh, briefly when do we have an advocate general in a case and what can we learn from that. So if we take a look at the composition of the court, we have a judge from each member state 27 altogether, and we have 11 advocate generals. There are permanent and advocate generals from each of the big five member states. And the smaller member states, and unfortunately I'm from a smaller member state, I would have liked to stay, uh, they serve only a term of six years. I am the second Danish advocate general since Denmark joined in 72 and the next time we will have an Advocate General will be in 2053, and I will not be applying for that. So it rotates between the smaller member states. This means that we have a limited number of Advocate Generals, so we should use the resources intelligently. So we only put Advocate Generals on cases that are important, where we have new questions of law, or which are extremely sensible. And I think I can say that both these criteria are fulfilled in your case law. It is often new questions of law and it is per definition sensible. Because as you know, I don't have to explain to experts like you, there is a class here between Eastern and Western Europe. I don't have to, uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to hide that. So these are often placed in chambers of five judges or even 15 judges. And 15 judges means that you are able to change case law. And I have asked cases to be in the Grand Chamber because I think there was a need to change case law here. Professor Hartley has said that an advocate general's opinion is a second opinion that just comes first. I think it's a good way to put it. The distribution of the cases is that you can see most of the cases that the court are preliminary rulings. And this is also goes for the four cases I will explain to you now. And if we just take a brief look on the distribution of cases, you can have the figures here. I won't go into deep with that. I will just mention to you that the court handles almost 900 cases a year. That's a lot. That means that that since all members of the court are involved in, in the case, in the discussion every Tuesday evening on the pending cases, that I have basically participated in discussion of 5,400 cases and part of them in this area. If we go now to the, 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 the theme of the day is the certificate, the A. The E-101 that was later replaced by the A-1 certificate. And that certificate is a statement of the applicable legislation. It is issued by the issuing member state, the, 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 the country where the worker is posted 
from, and it's binding on the authorities and courts in the country where he is posted to, the host member state. This certificate enjoys a presumption of validity, so it's binding on authorities and courts in the host state. And the purpose is to guarantee workers and the companies who send workers abroad that they, can, they are only affiliated with one system. This means that you can temporarily place workers in another country without having to pay, for example, social security in France, if that's where you're going to work. It builds on the principle of sincere cooperation. So if it's France that the workers are posted to, the French authorities have to work together with the authorities in the country where the workers come from. And that was precisely the problem in this case, Arosa's flu shift. We could see that these workers who were sent by Switch, Switch company into France, they were actually supposed to work on the rivers in Europe, which are per definition cross-border. But they ended up working on the Rhone River in France. So the French Supreme Court could see that they were clearly not fulfilling the requirements of enjoying this certificate. The problem is that the French authorities did not bother to speak with the Swiss about this, but just started initiating legal proceedings in France. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court in France, La Cour de Cassation, who, and I, I, you can see in the, in, in, in the small print, in the bottom, was sitting in full court. That means that all the judges at the Cour de Cassation decided to ask the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, do you mean it seriously when you say that this certificate is binding not only on the authorities in the home state, but also on the courts? Because we can see we want to set aside this document because they're clearly not fulfilling the requirements. Now, this case was put in a chamber of five. That was already a clear signal to the referring court that no case law was going to be changed. And I agree with that. Because one should remember with this case that there was no fraud involved. These workers were supposed to work cross-border, but ended up working only in one member state. So there was no fraud from the outset. And that was decisive in this case. The certificate is valid until the Swiss authority withdraw it, and the French did not ask the Swiss to do so uh, timely. My opinion is based on a balance between legal certainty and a correct implementation of the regulation, I, and I concluded that there was no problem here. There was no reason to depart from previous case law, despite of what was asked for by the French Supreme Court. The Court of Justice followed my opinion and said in this Chamber of Five that the certificate is binding not only on authorities but also on courts. But you should keep in mind that fraud was not invoked by the Cour de Cassation. This was different from the next case that I'm going to explain to you, from a Belgian case, where the Belgian Supreme Court ask, is this also the case when we can see fraud in front of us? In this case, workers from Belgium, uh, sorry, Bulgaria was posted into Belgium to work, but they have never worked in Bulgaria. They were engaged to work directly in Belgium. So the Belgian judges said to us, listen, we can see fraud here. And there has not been a correct communication between, with, with, between the Belgian and the Bulgarian authorities. What should we do? Well, the, the, the case uh, is uh, a particular one because they, there was a communication between the Belgium and the Bulgarians. But the Bulgarians did not answer timely on the request to redraw these documents. So the question was, what do we do then? 
I started my opinion with a quote from a French uh, uh, lawyer saying, le droit cesse où l'abus commence. We should never accept fraud. And if a Belgium judge, on the basis of the evidence and the witnesses and the, conduct, uh, the, the, the normal court procedures ends up at seeing that this is clearly fraud, my opinion was then, then it doesn't matter what the Bulgarians are saying. It should never be binding on a judge. It would be an odd situation if a national administration could dictate the result to a judge. That would not be uh, in conformity with the separation of power. And I think even the court had a duty to combat fraud. So my solution to the court was not to tolerate this. And I said, the member state in question, Belgium here, could disapply it. They could not declare it void or annulled because that would have effect ergo omnis. But they could say in this particular situation where we have proof of fraud, we could set it aside. What did the court answer? Well, it went to the Grand Chamber because for the first time, we were actually looking at a situation where we might have to change the case law. Until now, we have seen that this document had a presumption of validity that was almost impossible to reverse. But there is an exception, and the court followed me here, saying that fraud is this kind of exception. But the court said something that was not completely clear to me, that the procedures in the regulation needs to be followed. And maybe the court also said that if these procedures are not followed, if the Bulgarians are not asked, and if the Bulgarian do not answer in time, then you can set aside. But what does this mean? E contrario. Does that mean if the Bulgarian had answered and saying we disagree respectfully, we think that these workers are actually working in Bulgaria and are sent temporarily to Belgium, then the Supreme Court in Brussels would be bound by that interpretation. I think that this cannot be the case. And that's the question that I'm answering, asking you here, and I hope that you can have a debate on that. Does this mean, this ruling, that a national judge in Belgium would be bound by an interpretation of, um, uh, made by Bulgarian authorities. Now, another case came up. They came up constantly. And I was appointed, again, Advocate General, in the Welving case, which was a situation of workers sent from Spain into France. Now, According to the French authorities, that was not precisely the case because these people have never had an address in Barcelona. They lived in Rossi, uh, close to uh, the airport Charles de Gaulle. And for that reason, said the French authorities, you would not have a situation covered by this certificate. And in fact, and I said the bottom of this slide, in fact, you had a situation where the criminal section of the French Supreme Court set aside these documents without asking for a preliminary ruling, which was a bit daring, if you ask me, because it went contrary to the case law until now, and, and since you are last instance, you are under obligation to ask a question. But they didn't. Now, why did this come? at all to the Court of Justice. That's because there was a follow-up case in the civil part of the French uh, 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 Supreme Court. And they asked, is this certificate binding uh, on us? And does it matter how the criminal section of our court has handled the case? And this enabled the court to um, clarify the scope in the Altum case. If you look at the pleadings, and I have 
refer to them in my opinion, you could see that there were two different interpretation of the Altoon case law. On one hand, there was the interpretation that the court did not put conditions on the possibility for just to set aside the certificate in case of fraud. But on the other side, you had several governments, including the Czech and the Irish government, and notably the Commission, saying, well, the court did put conditions in Altoon. And they did say that fraud can only mean that you set aside a document if you have respected the procedures in the regulation. And you can only set aside if you have asked and you have not got an answer where these issues are appreciated. So the conflict was real. In my opinion, and you can read that, it's a very long one, I have to warn you. It's very long, too long. I just read it before I came here. It's, uh, I could have said it shorter. But my conclusion is that fraud is not acceptable. If we have here a situation where we have to respect posted workers, we should not start by accepting fraud. Fraud is exceptional, and it should set aside everything, in my opinion. So, of course you should use the procedure in the regulation. But even if you don't, you will still be able to set aside fraud. Or else you will have a bizarre situation where a judge have to accept fraud. Well, the court didn't agree with me. I hope there will be discussions on that. My opinion is that I still, and I have to be careful here, respectfully disagree with the solution. Because I think that the conclusion in this case is even more problematic than in Altun, because here it's spelled out. In Altun, you could at least read it in the way there was no condition. But here, there is no, uh, no, no doubt anymore. And that's what the court is saying. But again, if the issuing state um, if the issuing state then state that the certificate is granted in accordance with the regulation, does this mean that the court and the host member state have to tolerate fraud? I think that this is a difficult situation to accept, and I'm not sure it is completely in accordance with what the court has said in C 115.16, where we had, and there are several uh, case numbers here because it's joint cases, where the, uh, where, where money had been transferred through Luxembourg to take tax havens and where the court said very clearly, in case of fraud, you cannot invoke any rights under EU law. And it goes in all areas of law, except maybe, except maybe in your area of law. And I think uh, that should be changed. I'll turn at last, and I have two minutes left, I can see, to an Alpenrin case, where the situation was reversed, so to say. Here, there were posted workers coming from Hungary into Austria. We're getting closer to Krakow. And what happened here is a slaughtery in Austria were need of workers. They got them from Hungary. And the first company to send them was Martin Mead, who sent them workers to work in the slaughtery until 1st of January 2012, respecting the two-year limit. Afterwards, Alpenrind, the Austrians, went in to draw an, another contract with another Hungarian company to replace these workers for another two-year period. And eventually, they were replaced by workers from the first company again. Now the question that arose in this case was, is this abuse of law? And one might think, yes it is. I think it is not. I think that the regulation is clear. You can send, as a company, a Hungarian company, you can send workers to Austria to work two years. You're not supposed to replace them by other workers from your own company, 
but that doesn't mean that another company cannot take advantage of the European legislation in this area. And that's what I said here in the second uh, paragraph. You will have these slides if uh, there's a lot of text on them. But the thing is here, you have two different employers. And if you look at it from the Hungarian perspective, company B might not even know that Alpenrit had workers from company A before they sent their workers. So for me, it's pretty clear that this is not an abuse of law. Now, I'm getting used to not being followed by the court in this. Um, and oh, I, I go through, I, I went too fast according to my slides and said there's no, nothing in the word and there's nothing in travaux preparatoire that is uh, a hindrance here. And it is not an abuse. The court not only disagreed, but did so in an obiter dicta, which was even worse, because they were not supposed to answer the question, actually. Uh, but they did so and said, well, it is an abuse. But wait a little. What does this constitute? This constitutes that you look at it from the Austrian side. So the Austrians were not supposed to abuse this and have workers from Hungary constantly being replacing each other. But that's not, in my opinion, how the rule was written by the legislature. It is the right for companies in Hungary to send workers. It is, in fact, what I was reminded when I walked up the stairs to lunch. It is a part of Article 56 of the treaty. It's the right to deliver services, a fundamental right. And I think that here we do have also an issue. Is these rights the rights that belong to the companies who send workers? Or could it all of a sudden be an abusive uh, 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 problem if we look at it from the receiver of the services side? I think that's the main difference here. And I hope that you will have find time to discuss these issues and uh, also if we are in a situation where fraud is now to be accepted. And I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions to this, you're very welcome to contact me. Thank you very much for your attention.